I think Mike Trout might have DM'd you one time for, for meta yeah, advice. Yeah, is that yeah. true? Yeah, yeah, he did. He goes, hey, what's the meta right now? I haven't played. It was like the MP5 or something that like that during the Cold War. I think once Verdance does come back, I think it'll be... That's like my estimate. Today we welcome in Jay God, one of the most influential Call of Duty voices out there. Over 1.2 million subscribers on YouTube, over 320,000 followers on X, a man whose name is now synonymous with Call of Duty. The Meta Lord himself is Jay God. <laughs> How's it going? How are we doing, Jay God? <laughs> Good, good. So yeah, people might not have known, but J God is literally just an abbreviation of your actual name, right? It's not anything that yeah. So it's is pretty straightforward. Yeah, and th this is one of the ones that's always pretty funny. It's like, well, I just chopped the first three letters of my name, and just happened to be God. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. I, I mean, I made my clan tag or whatever when when I was like nine years old or ten or whatever the heck we came <laughs> online. It's like I just stuck with it. It wasn't like something I thought. Oh, you know, somebody's gonna think I'm. You know, claiming to be God at some yeah, point. Right. Yeah, I never, th I never thought about that, but I just stuck with it. It's easy. It is funny because, yeah, I mean, there's so many people who make gamer tags and it's something God or Jesus or whatever it is, and yours yeah. just, just naturally was Jacob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's talk about your early life, your childhood growing up. Um, what, I mean, what was your childhood like? Well, initially, I mean, we 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 had a, moved around a lot. Like, uh, uh, back when I was like two, my parents got divorced. Uh, we moved from house to house and, and you know, it's kind of one of those things where we're always kind of like moving. I think I went to like nine different schools growing up, maybe eight or something like that. I can't remember the names of the schools. That's how many, <laughs> but it kind of got stabilized around, I would say more, uh, around the time when I was like maybe seven or not, not seven or eight, uh, probably around nine or 10 years old. That's kind of when things kind of more stabilized and we kind of, settled down on where we were living and that was until i was probably about 15 16 and then we moved once more and that's kind of where i was for a while uh until i became an adult and those types of things uh but yeah i mean it was it was kind of weird because we did move a lot you'd always have to kind of make new friends and it's kind of almost like you were expected to like hey you know what it's, it's a new school year all right that sucks but yeah it's and, and it was so bad that even in my ninth grade year uh, you know, you finish the semester and then it's, you're ready for summer. We go to hang out and then my dad's like, oh yeah, by the way, I lost my job. I got a new job over here or whatever. And we're moving. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and this is before social media was like where it is today. You right. couldn't just go on Facebook and say, oh, friends, I'm, I'm going to miss you guys. No, it was like. Bro, I have to manually call people, like say, hey, <laughs> peace out, bro. I know we've been friends for like seven years and we've been in every class or whatever the case, but <laughs> peace, like, bye. So, I mean, I, I got to experience a lot of those types of things, which it, it does kind of, you know, allow you to have to get used to meeting new people all the time, which is, I think, beneficial, I think, in general. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be tough. Did, um, did you play video games like as a child all the way through or when did video games kind of come be uh, a part of your life? I think pretty much since the beginning. My uh, At the time before my parents did get divorced, my dad had a pretty good paying job. We had like a Nintendo, the original, like, you know, from the 80s, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we had like 50 games for it. Like, so there was like no shortage of games to be playing. And I would always play and would trade off with my brother. We'd do split screen. My older brother, he's four years older. So if I was like two-ish, ish, he was like six. So we would play. I wouldn't probably play a lot, but, you know, yeah. I'd play. <laughs> and then uh, basically every iteration of, like, console, we would continue to go forward. So then we'd move on to Super Nintendo, then the 64, then the GameCube, and then PlayStation, Xbox, you know, and it kind of just evolved from there. Uh, and then I... So I have like a wide variety of games that I've played and that's prior to Call of Duty even existed. Like right. I was like 15, uh, maybe nah, what, 18, 17, something when Call of Duty came out. The first one, yeah. In 2006, I was already graduated high school. Like, yeah. Whereas some of these people start when they're like, I don't know, <laughs> 8, 12, and they're godlike now. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're similar age, so I follow that same storyline with the same systems going up. Yeah. What are your, some of your favorite games you remember from a kid? I mean, my, I mean, I always go to Turtles in Time was always my go-to. I've probably played that game 150 times, probably more, and just beat it straight through. Any that stick out in your mind? Uh, I mean, back then, obviously, you had 
uh, like Super Mario, obviously Forms, that's yeah. like a, a classic. Then you had Street Fighter, uh, and then obviously Evolves. You get Tekken, you get RPGs, which I'm a really big fan of RPGs. Mario, uh, not Mario, Mario RPG is one of those too, but yeah. that's not the one I was thinking of. <laughs> uh, we had Chrono Trigger, you had uh, Final Fantasy 3, which now gets labeled as Final Fantasy 6 because of translation things with Japan or something like that. Uh, and I played a lot, a lot of different things. Mega Man. I mean, there's so many good games that came out prior yeah. to Call of Duty and just, you, you know, people miss out if they only stick to one game, I think. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, you kind of stabilized a little bit um, until about 15 or 16. I assume that's when you were entering high school or, or just starting high school. Yep. Um, what was high school like for you? High school was actually pretty, uh, pretty cool. Uh, I would say in, in the the ninth grade, part of my uh, whole entire four, four years, I was in a program called JROTC which is kind of like a military recruitment tool, essentially, if, if we're being honest. That's kind of what it is. But there's a lot of uh, structure there. You learn different things about the military. It replaces your PE credit. You could do it for two years, uh, and, and you're good. And I, in the ninth grade, I had a pretty structured one because the school I was at, uh, they'd been established like 15 years or something like that. They already, however long the program, they, they had a really well-rounded program. And then when I switched over to the 10th grade, like that was a more like new program. It only been around for like four years. <laughs> and like the original people that were there for the first day were like still there because like it only been around for four years. So yeah. I had all this experience when it came in. So it was kind of like, yeah, I know exactly what I'm talking about, about <laughs> all these things. And whereas people like they were just barely coming together. So I was able to be a part of that, which was kind of cool. Uh, I was more the the nerdy not nerdy but nerdy I'm, I'm not sure that's not a surprise to anyone <laughs> uh i got good grades you know i had a four point like one something because at the, my school it didn't offer a lot of uh ap classes i think it only offered like three yeah uh so you you couldn't really maximize the points that way but overall pretty good i did cross country um for one one year that was fun I, I was really big into running prior, and then once I got into ROTC, it was kind of like, yeah, I focus on that. I do good in school, hang out with your friends, and that's kind of the the bulk of it. Uh, you know, it's kind of is what it is. <laughs> and then, did, I mean, you uh, officially you joined the Marine Corps Reserves, right? After yes, I did. Uh huh. In two thousand six, uh, three days or four days after graduation, graduated on a Thursday, and then that Monday you go to I went to boot camp, and then after I graduated boot camp. Four days later, I started UCLA. So <laughs> so it was pretty hectic. I didn't really have a summer that year. But yeah, yeah it was it was a good time. I, I enjoyed the military. I wish, like if I had to do it again, I would either not do it at all or I would have done active duty. I think uh, the reserve part of it is cool when you're actually doing the different training. It feels like you're full time. But then when you actually have to do the two, one week in a month or whatever the case is, it, it's just like you go there, everyone has their full-time job. They don't really want to be there. Yeah. Uh, especially as people get older now, like I would probably be the same where you're more out of shape and the, cause they have a full job and, and whatever. And then you're going there for the weekend. It's <laughs> yeah. like, and where I was at, uh, I was a basic electrician, 1141. And at the specific place where I would go for my weekends, there was literally nothing to do. And there's like nine of us. And it was so crazy that one time uh, they go, okay, we're going to, we're looking for, uh, uh, you know, electricians, you know, to deploy. We, we only need one. So then all nine of us raise our hand like, oh yeah, we're down. And then they go, okay, you. And then that was it. Like I never got a chance <laughs> to deploy. And I was like, damn. So it's kind of like I missed out on that portion too. Uh, even though there's safety concerns with deploying, especially during that time. Sure. It's still like you didn't really feel like you got the military experience, but if I was active duty, I a hundred percent would have, you know? Yeah. So it's just kind of one of those things. I enjoyed it, but like I said, it, I would either not do it at all or I would go all the way. Yeah. yeah the, the halfway in between just didn't, it didn't work. And so then you said after that, you went to UCLA. What'd you go to school for there? I was going to school for uh, mathematics. I wanted to be a math teacher. So basically you do your five years, you get your credential, that kind of, that was the general flow of it. Uh, the, the problem that I didn't expect is like how hard UCLA would be compared to high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I, w I wasn't staying on campus, I wasn't like the traditional first year, second year that they kind of recommend you be on campus. 
Uh, so I didn't do any of the social aspects of college in, in that regard. I had a full-time job. So kind of like what my schedule would look like is my wife uh, at the time, we weren't married yet, but my wife at the time, pretty much we'd get up at like 4.30 in the morning. I'd go drive her to culinary school in Hollywood. Uh, and coincidentally, UCLA is on the same street. Uh, it has oh, the nice. school. Yeah. Um, so you go down Sunset. I think it's Sunset or Vine, whichever one. I think it's Sunset. You just keep driving down. And then I pull up to UCLA at like 7.30 uh, or 7 o'clock. And then I'd usually put an alarm, go take a nap. And I'm like, okay, cool. My first class is at 8. I wake up at 7.45. I go run to class. My class would be from 8, 8.50, 9, 9.50, 10, 10.50. And then that's my three classes for that day. <laughs> and then I go jump back in the car and I drive back down Sunset, pick up my wife at noon. And then she'd be coming out of her six hour long culinary school. And then I would drive home through traffic in LA, 25 miles, like an hour <laughs> yeah. and a half. And then I would get changed, get ready for work. And then I would start work at two and then I'd go pretty much till 11 o'clock. Yeah. So that would be like, that was my day. Obviously I had off days from school sometimes and then off days from work. And so that would be cool if they lined up. But for the most part, that was my day to day. And basically you had no free time. Essentially, yeah. other than if things lined up perfectly or you're out of school or whatever the case was. And it was a sales job, so it was very performance based. So there's stress related to that and you're trying to make money and you know, all these other life, you know. Yeah. So it was pretty hectic, which was unfortunate because then I didn't really have like the opportunity to do as well at UCLA as I would have if I just was a student right you know? so okay. so that part kind of sucked and it was expensive too so <laughs> <laughs> yeah and if you i mean you can just tell just by talking to you the way you talk about like your schedule obviously the way you kind of came into the war zone medicine a bit you've always had seems like a very analytical mind is that fair to to say and you know what what do you kind of how does that affect your, your day-to-day -day life or or is that kind of how you would classify yourself even? I would. I think sometimes uh, it is a little bit uh, abrasive for some people that aren't used to that because uh, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you were being rude. And I was like, I just told them like as succinctly as possible. I don't know what they want a story <laughs> yeah. to make them feel better, but that's just not how it works. And because of that, uh, it can become off as abrasive versus people that have actually met me or interacted with me for a long period of time, they know that's not the case. It just is what it is. Um, and I'm going to be honest about what I have to say. And sometimes people don't like that. And, you know, it is what it is. But it's also helped in a lot of other ways because I can see things more from an analytical side instead of in the emotional side. Uh, so you can kind of take some of that element away from it sometimes, which I think is helpful in certain decision making just to know that, okay, this is what I have to do regardless if it's what I want to do or what I need to do or whatever, you know, you can make decisions a little bit more straightforward. Yeah. And so you mentioned your wife and I think we got to kind of get into this a little bit. I don't know if everyone uh -huh. knows, but um, in 2015, there was a mass shooting in San Bernardino. Yep. Fortunately, your wife was a victim of that along with, I think, 14 other people or 15 other people. What do you remember about that day? You know, what's going through your mind? Do you remember anything from that day, I guess? Because I know sometimes like when I go through something tragic, not as tragic as that, you know, I kind of push it out of my mind and I kind of yeah. black out. But do you remember anything from that day? Uh, I, I would say it's probably one of the most memorable days. Sadly enough, it sure. is uh, like from the times of the days that things were happening. I actually worked that day. Uh, so when I went into work, I'm all sitting down and, and I worked in a gym at that time. And they have like big old projection screens, all the monitors up. And there's like, oh, there's a shooting down the street, essentially. It's, mm -hmm. it's not down the street, but essentially. And then I'm getting phone calls be like, hey, I haven't heard from my wife, which was Aurora. And they're like, oh, wh what's going on? I can't get a hold of her. Like, is she OK? I was like, I, what do you mean? So then I'm like, OK, cool. Let me check it out. And then basically there's no news because everything's happening so quick. And then I wait a little bit. I was like, OK, well, I'm going to wait because I really can't do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, there's nothing you can do. And then I go, you know what? Well, I'm going to go down there now that it's been a couple hours. Supposedly there was like a staging area and eh, relatively close to the area, mm -hmm. which was essentially a school gymnasium. And one of her friends that she had worked with, but didn't work in the same department because it was a department thing where it was a Christmas party. They came together and people, you know, it just happened the way it happened. Yeah. And, uh, how do I say it? Basically, 
I went down there and I, I remember vividly picking up my son from daycare and that was crazy because he's just there playing on the table yeah, or no whatever idea. the case right, is. Yeah. No freaking clue. So then I go and take him um, to the to her friend's house, which essentially like was to babysit. And then I go to the 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 center and this time I'm thinking, eh, you know what? Like you start thinking like, oh man, hopefully nothing bad happened but like well obviously if there's no communication something happened so hopefully feeling, she's yeah. just injured not like you know what i mean right like you think those types of things so that maybe you can get a hold of them that way so you wait these buses show up like i mean it was pretty vivid like i remember pretty much each detail and then driving home and even the next day i remember it specifically uh to kind of redirect it a little bit is that we went we got the news that hey yeah it's official this is what happened and then we go back to my sister's house and we're just Chilling there. It's Thursday night. And this is uh, Packers on versus the Lions. Yeah. And then Aaron Rodgers throws this insane Hail Mary. Like, so, like, these things are all back to back. Yeah. Even though they're not relatable. Like, I'll, like, that's that little window. It's like every second. Yeah. You remember it all. Is detailed. And I've thought about this too over and over. It's like, damn, I can actually remember, like, yeah. each step. Obviously, I skipped some stuff there. Sure, but yeah. Yeah. It gets kind of crazy. I mean, so now you're uh, like the worst thing that you can imagine has happened. You have a one year old son, you know, and I know that it's impossible to go through each step. But like, you know, what is the next steps for you? What are you thinking at that time? Like, are you even thinking like, well, now I got to do this. I got to do this, you know? Yep. So there was actually a lot going on at the time. Uh, like from outside, there was news. They wanted to do an interview like every every place because it's national news, worldwide news. Yeah. Uh, because it was part of a terrorist attack. It wasn't just like a normal shooting. It was actually considered labeled as a terrorist attack. Yeah. And uh, under that, you know, there was all these different meetings and, and groups and all these. It was like a nonstop bar barrage of support. But it, it does feel like, dang, this is crazy. Uh, so it, basically, initially, I go, OK, well, we got to get, you know, back to essentially business as usual. Mm -hmm. So. Within six weeks, um, they, the president came and met us. Uh, there's Obama and his wife. And they met us. They met each of the families of the impacted families. And then basically a couple weeks later, uh, I ended up going back to work. Like within six weeks, I was already back at work. Mm -hmm. And people were like, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I have to work. Like, you know, it is what it is. And I still had my son in daycare. Right. But the problem with the sales is I had to reorient my schedule because the daycare doesn't line up with the perfect sales where you're sure. working late hours or whatever. So after about a month or two, I just like, well, I have enough income coming in from life life insurance and, and other things. I'm spending $1,000 a month in daycare <laughs> Yeah, for this uh, two-year-old now. And uh, you know what? I'm just going to stay home. Yeah. And I'll figure it out. So I had enough where I knew, okay, I could take comfortably. I could probably take off five years, not have to worry about like anything. And then after that, eh, maybe I just got to be more safe with my spending. You know, sure, yeah. like I could really be conservative and I'll be fine. And then, uh, essentially I just took a year off, spent time with my son. We'd go to the store a couple times a week. He'd pick out whatever the heck he wanted from target or, <laughs> or whatever. We'd go chill. We'd go to Disneyland a lot. We had the passes already. So nice. we would just like, boom, we'll just go. Oh, you know what? I'll go Tuesday, three hours. All right, cool. He's tired. Let's go home. No big deal. It's like, you didn't really have a schedule. Mm -hmm. And then probably about six months later, um, I was like, you know what? Let me finish my degree so I can get into teaching. So I found out that I only needed like one class for my associates. Nice. So I am the school reached out and um, they ended up or the school once I reached out, they're like, oh, you know what? Your, your wife was only like two units away or two whatever classes away, too. So we'll actually award her a degree posthumously oh, or whatever. Oh, cool, yeah. So I finished mine so I could walk. Mm -hmm. And then I also accepted technically her degree at the same time. So the school did that part. And it was, that was part of a thing, too. That's really cool. Yeah. And then um, basically uh, beyond that, I was just kind of hanging out, planning. I started online school. And then I got back kind of into gaming and like stuff like that, where I was like, you know what? I have this free time. My son takes a nap. I'm cool. Like whatever. It was just chill mm -hmm. until I, you know, I got to finish my degree in two years. Then I'll go to work and then I'll be back to normal. My son will be in school. Like that was kind of the thought process. And then I got into YouTube and, and I was like, oh, okay. I know how math works. 
if I do this and it grows to this part, then that's enough to pay my bills. I'll make more than a, a teacher. Yeah. So it was like, I'll just keep doing that. And fortunately, Warzone exploded and we were <laughs> able to not have to worry about that portion of it, you know? Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, and I think it's really cool to hear that story. I mean, you could have obviously just given up completely. Um, and uh, it's just really cool to see where you are now. So I, I wanted to give people that background and kind of show them like what you came through to get to where you are now. Um, and you talked about getting into YouTube. Do you remember like the first time you got into YouTube? I mean, we're both old. So like YouTube didn't always exist. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't <laughs> part we of the normal. Up. Yeah, it wasn't part of the normal. What happened was there's a game called The Division that came out um during black ops three year i just didn't play that year because of the timing with my i was just like i didn't game but by the time i got back into it one of my uh my cousin my brother and my cousin's friend they were all playing the division we we're gonna play the division we'd been waiting on the division for like three years or whenever when it got teased so then we jumped in on the division and we were playing it and then i ended up finding youtube somehow around that time I think maybe he recommended videos mm. and there was a guy by the name of skill up, which still has a YouTube channel now, nice. but his channel is like gameplay reviews. Like he just reviews game oh, nice. and he's from Australia, cool voice, whatever. But he was a data, a data driven type of channel. And then once that game kind of started fizzling out, I go, you know what? I always play COD. Let me get back into COD. I've never dropped the nuke. Even though I've had decent enough stats, I just never went on a 30 streak or whatever mm -hmm. in any of the Call of Duties, even though I played them all. So I said, ah, you know what? Let me get better at that. But now YouTube was part of the, the pool. So I was like, oh, you know what? Let me search up how to get a nuke. Boom. First video comes up, exclusive ace. And then I'm like, oh, cool. This guy's a data guy too. You know, so I was like, <laughs> yeah. and then I started, you know, going down the rabbit hole of like, okay, all these tips on uh, the pro tips and this tip and that guide and this, this, and then you end up like really getting better instantaneously, essentially. You just absorb all that information. And I was like, damn, okay, I'm pretty smart. I can do this. And then probably within like six days or something, I already, I, then I dropped my first nuke and it was just like that, that quick. And then after that, it, it became much easier. And this was probably around April, May, June of 2017. And then I go, you know what? I could do this too. Like I can do a channel. I can provide a service to try and help people get better because it worked for me. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, I know what worked and I could see it from both perspectives. So my first channel is like breaking down like my own gameplay, yeah. which is like, a when, <laughs> you know, it was one of those that dropped like a, a 37 kill streak on, you know, sky dock or something. I'm not sky dock terminal. It's like terminal. Mm -hmm. Not, not, yeah, it's terminal, but an IW. So it was one of those. And, um, uh, and that's kind of where my channel started. And my mic sucked. My recording sucked. Like all that stuff sucks when you first start. Sure, my thumbnail yeah. is trash, you know, but I was really like a learner at the time. And this is, um, I was still had school, but it's like, I had my son and it's like, I still had a little free time. Right. So like I would wake up and I'd search, okay, how to make YouTube thumbnails, how to edit <laughs> yeah. videos, what's the best mic for, you know, recording. Da, da, da. And then I go down that rabbit hole. And I pretty much just continue to evolve from that portion. And it kind of just worked out that way. And I've kind of evolved into my own lane. And then luckily, um, like I said, Warzone popped off and, and it worked out that I didn't have a lot of competition within that same niche or else, you know, it may have not been the same growth. It still would have been huge because everyone popped off from Warzone, but not the same. Yeah. Were you seeing uh, first a step back? You know, I, I don't I hope everyone realized I think people who are watching this obviously realize, but like me playing Call of Duty through college, sitting on my couch with my buddies, you know, on a giant big screen TV, you know, your KD is, I think my KD was, I don't know, probably like right around 1.75 probably. Mm -hmm. um, then you start consuming content. You're like, oh, wait, I could actually get better at this. And your KD goes up pretty fast. I think if I went from like a, a 0.75 to like a 3.1 in that first like iteration of Warzone, like towards that period. And so consuming content definitely helps. Did you see growth in your first like videos at all before it kind of blew up into war zone. So it was kind of like a steady, uh, like small growth, but it was consistent. So in the beginning, uh, it was IW. So I had uploaded a few videos. I didn't expect to grow mm -hmm. initially. I, I just like, Oh, like the plan is to upload in world war two, the new game that's coming out. 
Um, but I need reps. So I would upload. I was almost spam uploading uh, and getting the hang of it. And try, And initially, I only did like three uploads a week. And then five. And then it was seven. And it was like every <laughs> single day. And it almost became like obsessive to do something uh, in a way. Because it's like, oh, cool. I like this. You know, I can learn this aspect. I can learn this aspect. I'm, trying, I'm evolving in these aspects. So you continually to grow. Same way you would improve in COD. You know, you can have those aspirations or a sport or whatever. You kind of get that drive every morning. You're trying to get better. And uh, initially, that that uh, wasn't great because the game was already at the end of the life cycle. It wasn't a very popular COD. I even uploaded uh, Destiny came out, Destiny 2. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I'm going to grind some of this. And then I'm just going to get the reps. Not necessarily the content, but the reps on how to make videos. So I made probably about 8 to 10 videos of Destiny 2 before World War II came out. I even did a couple reviews that are still on my channel for uh, South Park, the, the, the game that came out, <laughs> yeah. Assassin's Creed, uh, Odyssey, or, or Origins, or whatever the heck came out at that time. They all came out around the same time. Yeah. And then, um, and then I started World War II videos, and uh, I just started posting. And I did what a lot of people did. I did loadouts, whatever, because that's kind of like uh, the trap a lot of people just get sucked into. It's just organic mm -hmm. because that's what gets the most views but i would usually do the the little bit of a twist where most people they would do live com where they would just play and if they talked they talked if they didn't they didn't and then they would just edit it make it look like a cool gameplay oh well, i would still get the gameplay but with no voice and then i would do a complete voiceover in the editing software Mm. editing talking over the same gameplay so i'd be like hey look at here i'm looking at the mini map you can see the spawns flipped and i was more doing educational because that's what i wanted to do but if i titled how to get better at domination those videos don't get any views mm. so i was kind of like clickbaiting in a way yeah. i still gave the class setup for the weapon <laughs> but the video was really about how to get better and how to play better and how to improve which like you know i, I enjoy that style of content because I think it could be beneficial and I think there's actually a rewarding aspect to it instead of I'm good at the game, enjoy my gameplay. I, I, I do see there's a value in that for people, but yeah. it's not the same value I would enjoy. I don't watch that content. Sure. And so in terms of like your editing and everything that you do, it sounds like it's just all self-taught. Yeah, pretty much everything I've done, I've pretty much self-taught. Uh, YouTube is a valuable resource. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, pretty much if you want to look something up, like, well, how do I do split screen? How do I do this? How do I make a, a widget? How do I, like, you could literally look up everything and there's some random video with terrible audio out there that has a perfect tutorial, very succinct and, and tells you exactly what you want to do. And then through trial and error, you, you learn it for yourself. And then if it's something you actually want to incorporate in, you incorporate it. And, and it just is that easy. So you're making YouTube videos, you're getting all your reps in and Warzone comes out. Is it just immediate explosion for you or what is that growth like? So it, it wasn't, um, not, not really. Uh, because we already still had pretty good pacing when modern warfare 2019 came out. I had already had a hundred thousand subs. Okay. And then each, each month I was gaining probably like 15 to 20,000 subs. So by the time Warzone came out, I was close to like 150, 200,000 subs. And it was, it was cooking, but it didn't like cook more all of a sudden cause Warzone dropped. Um, and it was just kind of a steady growth throughout the year and nothing felt like an explosion until year two. That's where everything went went absolutely insane. Uh, Cold War integration offered a unique problem where none of the weapons and attachments literally did anything they said and didn't match the base game. So it was a huge problem mm -hmm. that essentially only one or two people other than myself in the community actually cared about trying to even solve. Sure. And it was basically me, exclusive A, uh, not exclusive Ace. Exclusive Ace was more for multiplayer, so he didn't care about Warzone at that point, which again is a, is a, was a pro for me. Thank you, exclusive Ace, for not liking <laughs> What's up, Warzone. Guys? My I name guess. Is Ace? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then the other one is uh, True Game Data, which also around this time he is getting his website started up. I had already done, I believe, a shout out at this point for his website, um, and he was already getting some traction. But since I already had the following. Obviously, that you know, you got more subs. You're generally going to get more views, especially relative to to somebody else, even mm -hmm. if they're making good content. So, everyone wanted answers, and even if you hated me, I was the guy that had the answers essentially at that time. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of like a it was kind of like a double edged sword where 
everyone had to watch that content or or hear about that content and, and it would be like i would go to streams and i would stop chatting because then people would be just spamming me instead of <laughs> paying attention to the streamer and i'm like bro i, I want to hang out and watch the streamer too but uh it, it it was kind of an interesting part and there was like a lot of those catalysts that were happening where the game people would spam hey j god said this j god said this j god said this and it was like well yeah i did say that and then they have to watch the, like the clip or whatever the case is and that dominoed into a couple different catalysts where uh the first i would say notable person that probably uh like vouched i guess for me or, or pointed out to something related to Twitter is Teep. Uh, one of the people in his chat, this is around the DMR meta before, like I had really a big surge and they go, Oh, um, well, J God said this barrel is better because it has better bullet velocity, whatever. It was not accurate to what it said, yeah. but since I had tested every barrel on every gun on every distance, whatever I had the data and then I could prove it side by side. And then he was, he checked it out and he goes, well, you know what? He's right. And then I got a follow on Twitter. And then a lot of times with your circle, people are like, oh, T follows that guy. Okay. He must be somebody that I know or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then boom. And then it was just kind of one of those domino effects. And then, you know, Nick Merckx, you know, and Tim, the tap man. And it was like big, big names around that time where it was like, oh yeah. J God said, boom, done. Yeah. Or, or the streamer would turn it back on them. And they'd be like, well, what'd J-God say? And then the chat <laughs> yeah. would be like, oh, yeah, he said this. So it was kind of an interesting time. I think it was uh, very unique with COVID and all that stuff. But my biggest month was around that March uh, of 2021, um, March, April, where I gained about 150,000 subs in a month. And I had 19 million long form views before short form was like a thing that we did. Yeah. So it was like a huge, a huge, huge series of months there where everything was just ridiculous. You couldn't do any wrong. Like yeah. literally you could post anything you, and it was, <laughs> it was popping. I remember it was so crazy that iron, like literally if anyone wrote a question in iron chat, he had a thing set up to automatically just say, because Jay God said so like literally. For oh yeah. I think Shaded got the same thing too. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do the different COD cycles affect your work schedule? Uh, I assume it has some sort of effect, but you know, every year is a different COD cycle. What does your work schedule kind of go around those? So before Warzone, it was pretty straightforward um, where you kind of have the hype, the game would stabilize, it would die a little bit, it would come back up, and then it would die again, and then new game again. It would just be that cycle with warzone it's kind of overlapped it a little bit where i think the deader portion of warzone is deader for a, like a, a stronger stretch but when it's good it, it's it's because it's free to play the the that that part stretches much further as long as the game's good uh, i tweeted a couple days ago about the like you know the spike mw2 had with warzone 2 and that was huge and then the drastic fall off um that that was a problem of the yeah, game. Right. But normally how it works is usually around this time, I'm chilling, enjoying the beta. I don't need to go crazy. Uh, probably within the next month or so, I'll make my list of all the videos I plan to make at the start. Uh, even maybe doing some base scripting on certain things. I go look at older videos, what did well, what didn't. Look at the actual retention charts. Where did people click away? What could I change in this one in a settings video or whatever video? Uh, somebody else got like a million views on this video and they only have like 30,000 subs. What the heck were they doing? Let me go check that out relative to their sub count. Uh, and then as soon as the game comes out, then it's just like full on grind mode where you might grind eight to 12 hours of actual gaming. And then you're doing like three to four hours of videos. Then you sleep and do it again, usually for a few weeks. And then by the time Warzone, now we get like a second spike because now it's a Warzone spike. And then we already kind of have all the analytics. We find out, you know, data, like there's a series of stuff we do. And then basically we're good on content and probably until the mid season update or so, which is like the beginning of January. And then, mm -hmm. then we go update base, like, oh, cool. We'll cover the update. We'll cover what the current metas are. Uh, let's cover some other new tips. Oh, this particular attachment. We try to maybe talk about some evergreen content where it's just like the state of COD. Hey, you know what? Here's COD life cycle or whatever, whatever. There, there's lots of things that uh, you kind of cover through, but that's general cycle. And then 
right around the summer again, once the new game starts hyping, then, you know, it kind of winds down and you don't really lose much by not posting as much because the views are lower anyways. Yeah. And so now you've blown up. Uh, you have people from all over the place DMing you for meta advice. I think Mike Trout might have DM'd you one time for, for meta yeah, advice. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, he did. He goes, hey, what's the meta right now? I haven't played. And it was like the MP5 or something that like that during the Cold War. That's so And funny. it was, and you know, it, a lot of athletes and stuff like that around that time. Uh, I think Trevor Noah DM'd me one time and he was like, hey, you know, there's a bug with this. And I was like, Whoa, what? <laughs> Dude. I was like, that's kind of cool. I'm like, um, let me double check. Is this a real person? Like, yeah. what the heck? So it's kind of a unique experience with that where it's just like, oh, okay, that's cool. But like <laughs> surreal at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that was kind of funny. Uh, and now you're really big uh, part of the Pulse Check. And Pulse Check has obviously had an impact on the community. You know, what do you think is the biggest impact that Pulse Check has had on the Warzone community since it started out? I, I think it's been one of those things where we can kind of just talk about stuff. And we can openly give feedback. I think one of the, the biggest downsides with uh, a lot of times just content creators is they get on the game and they do give feedback, but it's not formal. And they just like, maybe they're yapping about something specific like, oh, these things. But there's no like central place for any devs or anyone to be able to actually obtain that feedback unless they just happen to be watching it. Sure. Just happen to be. Uh, and... I, there are YouTubers like myself where I'll give a feedback video, I'll do this, but it's usually fewer and far between the number of people that do that compared to loadouts, right? If we're being honest, it loadouts, you stick on the loadout, boom, you live calm, and that's it. Um, with the thought, you have to actually get your thoughts out, write them down, oh, well, the pros and cons, a little bit more work. Um, so less people do it. And I think this gave that the opportunity for different perspectives because like I said, I have a... Uh, more of a perspective where I've been the casual, I've been the average player, I've been the above average player, I've been the nuke guy, uh, and then now I'm just like the chill data guy who happens to be 36, you know, like one of those <laughs> versus, uh, and then you got uh, Hector, which is comes from more of the competitive background, like uber competitive, um, and now he's getting like towards the the higher end of age when it comes to <laughs> competitive gaming. So there's that. And then we have sometimes different people that cycle in with like Ebates. He He's now like a, a permanent fixture. Uh, and then on the watch parties, you got Rampage and, and, <laughs> and Crinks. But it's kind of one of those things that um, when it comes to the actual Pulse Check podcast portion, the things we talk about definitely get seen and they get heard much more. It kind of allowed that uh, to get... Uh, what do they call that? Where basically it gets pushed to the the people that need to hear it. Sure, yeah. And I know we don't make up the entire uh, opinions, but they can read chat. They can they can see what we're talking about. They can see whether or not we're just talking to talk or like there's actually legitimate feedback there. And there's some things that we've even theory crafted or, or talked about where they may not have thought about, and then in a year they add it. Whether like it's this dedicated melee from like apex maybe that's just something they happen to think of before but yeah. that's something that like we talked about like the first months of pulse check mm -hmm. uh, and then i think recently we've had way less episodes just because of all the watch party stuff sure yeah and generally i don't do as many watch parties just because it's a little bit different vibe on the the, the stream essentially um and i know like in your recent video uh one of the most recent ones i watched anyway was warzone will never be back which you know is true Part of the war zone was magic, you know, lightning in a bottle because the pandemic was happening at the exact same time. But is that the only reason war zone can't be back ever is because we would need another pandemic where everyone is stuck at no. home or, you know, what, why, why can't war zone truly be back, you know, taking the pandemic part out of it? So I think there's a couple different elements is a lot of people that started war zone came back to the franchise that hadn't played COD in like a decade. That'll never happen again. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're not going to get this huge influx of new players that have never played COD in like forever. Um, so that's part one of it. Uh, and all those people that did, they've essentially become accustomed to the game the way it is now. And um, people's expectations and entitlement have changed a little bit too. I, I, I would bet $100,000 that if they give us exactly Warzone 1, exactly. Mm -hmm. No changes exact same metas 
whatever, whatever, people would still complain <laughs> like they do today. Yeah, hundred percent. There's no doubt, uh, and uh, we see it even now because Modern Warfare Three is pretty good. Like the the version that we have right now in Warzone, pretty good. Besides the meta issue that's dry as hell, it's pretty good. But people still like. No, I want. I want to be. I want to spam L three so bad to tax sprint. It's like, well, you don't need to. You get unlimited tax sprint. But I want a tax sprint. You know, it's slant, you know, I want a slide cancel. So I think there's that part of it. I think Bo six is set up to be really good. The integration, what we played and what people saw, I think is going to be awesome. But there's a lot of toxicity in COD. So there's always going to be people vocal about how they hate it. No matter if in it, during 2019, <laughs> Warzone 1, no matter what, there was always people hating the game too, and they still hate it too, every day. But they play it 8 yeah. to 10 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say four letters, and it's going to drive everyone absolutely crazy. S-B-M-M. Um, players like me, and I believe like you, you know, we're potentially around like a 2 or 3 KD, so we're definitely... Um, I mean, I think I suck, but I know that I'm like, you know, whatever, three top 3%, whatever it might be. Uh huh. Um, you know, I think almost for us, it's like the hardest because we're too good to be in a protected lobby, but we're not good enough to be playing with some of the people that are in those lobbies. What's the balance in SBMM? Can it ever be fixed or will people just, it will just be a constant battle? Uh, I think part of that is uh, the thing we talked about earlier where people just have gotten better. That is definitely part of it. Uh, but they're but they put out their white paper. They essentially broke it down, and the top ten percent of players are impacted the most. Essentially, that's what it comes down to. The top ten percent of players are negatively impacted the most. The other ninety percent of players generally benefit from it, and the the benefit and con part of it is how much playtime they have. Generally, when there's less SBMM on the the lower ninety percent, they play longer. The top 10%, they play less. That's just kind of how it is. And 90% makes a lot more money than the 10%. Even though those diehards buy everything, the 90% is just such a, a large number that they're protecting. And I don't see them ever changing that because of that system. Obviously, people are going out of their way to circumvent <laughs> those systems. Yeah. Uh, and, and as a double edge, I don't think there's really anything Activision can do to stop it. Because it's not against TOS and playing with a friend technically can't be against TOS either. So <laughs> right. it's like, I, I think they're kind of stuck between that rock and a hard place. It's just like the, the cheater problem. Uh, you know, there's another uh, pocket of issues <laughs> yeah. there. By having SBMM, the, chicker, the, the cheaters are often going to be in that top 10%. So they are also keeping that out of the 90% of the player mm -hmm. pool. So it actually doubles as a... a a ricochet in a sense because <laughs> it's isolating those players to the top and that's why i think the top players generally going to run into them more often and you segued perfectly into it you know how big is the cheater problem in, in warzone or, or just call of duty in general i mean it feels like you know the the accuser channels we'll call them have died down quite a bit which is good to see but you know uh, cheater cheating is a problem in call of duty um, how big of a problem is it? Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I know I got quoted as saying something like 3% or something like that. I don't really know what the number is. I, I will say that the number is, isn't going to change. Like unless the anti cheat changes, mm -hmm. uh, there's always people out there trying to cheat in some way, whether it's one way or another, they're, they're trying to cheat to whether they enjoy it because they get to ruin people's day or they just feel good about themselves. I don't know. The only thing that could really realistically change it is having a more invasive anti-cheat. But from people I've actually talked to, it doesn't sound like that would actually be the solution because the problem with that is you, by making a more intrusive anti-cheat, you actually actively limit the number of players that are going to play the game. You're going to cut people off. Uh, the example would be with Valorant, for example. That's like a hardcore player base. COD is hyper-casualized, mm -hmm. right? So it, the hardcore people, they have no problem getting invasive, invasive anti-cheat. They set it up. Boom. The cat, COD casual, they're like, no, nah, I got to download something. No, nah, I ain't playing that. Sorry. I'll just move on to something easier to play. And even though it would protect them and give everyone a better gaming experience, the number of people that would play the game because of this invasive anti-cheat is probably 
a greater number. Maybe they've weighed the odds on Activision's end. They've weighed the odds to say that number's worse than doing as good as we can with the current situation to try and stop cheaters and people actively leaving from people actually cheating. Sure. So I don't know. That's at least my theory behind it. I, I really feel like it would be better if they could make it better without being intrusive. Um, and you you talked about COD Next. You just got back from COD Next. What was the general sentiment when you were there with other creators you were talking to on how the game feels, how we think the integration is going to be with Warzone? I think most people were generally happy. Uh, one of the feedbacks was, everyone was like, oh, multiplayer feels better than, than Warzone. And it's like, well, it's because you don't have your perks, you don't have your loadouts. So I think that was a little bit part of it because uh, the conversations almost go the same. Well, what perks were you using? Oh, I was using these ones. Well, that's probably why it felt better. Oh, I didn't even think of that. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, good thing we had this conversation. <laughs> but uh, but it's kind of one of those things where I think, excuse me, I think uh, generally it's received, it was received positively, uh, especially after the issue that we had with MW2 um, being such a bad, bad experience. People walked out of there with their head down like, oh, this can be miserable. I got clipped several times ranting about the game in a, in a very bad way. <laughs> and uh, it, it was what it was. MW3 has kind of done a little bit to regain some of the goodwill of the players, of uh, the feedback listening to. Besides the meta issue that we have in Warzone, uh, the game has generally been good. Multiplayer is pretty good. Modern Warfare Zombies wasn't supported, but what they did put out was relatively okay. And then going into this next game, I think uh, people are a little bit frustrated that we're not getting a new map, at least until Verdance comes back, which isn't a new map. But <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, I think generally people are positive, especially compared to the past two years. It's kind of just gone up and then up again. Omni Movement's gotten a lot of press. I don't know if it's the the best thing about the new one. It's probably not, but you know, a lot of people are talking about it. Do you think Omni Movement is something that will become part of? I don't know. If, calling it part of the meta makes sense, but do you think it's something people are going to use all the time or is it very situational where it's, it's going to be used, you know, once in a while during gameplay? So I would say that the, the, like the general Omni movement is going to be used like a hundred percent of the time because it's sprint in 360, mm -hmm. you know, slide in 360. That'll be pretty, pretty common. I think um, the dive, it is very useful, but it does have its strengths and weaknesses. So I think that one will be a little bit more, use space uh it's not going to be like oh we, we spam slide cancel oh yeah we're just going to spam diving everywhere as we've seen with the beta the more people play it the less they're diving unless it's situational but they are definitely taking advantage of the omni sprint omni slide and utilizing that more and i think that uh especially after going back to some of the other cods between the beta like mw3 or even um zombies or warzone you it's it's hard it feels slow strafing and going backwards and like that part is definitely noticeable so i think that is just going to be a core, core part of the game the dive i think other games could uh, like future games whether it's uh, iw or sledgehammer they could take different interpretations on the slide uh, the dive but i think that uh, the base omni movement I, I don't think that's going anywhere i think that's here to stay forever and you've talked about modern warfare 2 quite a bit obviously big disappointment for at least um a majority or a large majority of, of the player base it felt like um and, and you were vocal about that you made videos about that did that negatively affect your standing with with activision or any of the studios at all no <laughs> no well because uh, part of it is um I, I think i've done a really good job in general uh, of, of trying to be very vocal critical but not being really like an asshole mm -hmm. which i think that's part of the problem with a lot of creators get into they're like oh i can't speak my mind well you definitely can it's like saying cod is trash that doesn't do any good to nobody <laughs> yeah like oh it's trash because the spawns aren't good the hit regs bad the connections bad you know you can go down a list of things that are actually bad mm -hmm. and then there's actual feedback there versus oh these devs need to go do something to themselves or oh, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you that, know people yeah. get pretty crazy but these are even creators that do these things and they're like oh, i don't know why i don't get invited and it was like well <laughs> like you know it's not you don't have to be a yes man i mean i was a a terrible like i i posted like Basically, I hated COD for two years. Yeah, almost. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I had no problem. And I got invited and I still get invited to pretty much everything. And I think that's the uh, having tact is, is really important. I think a lot of people 
tend to lack that, especially when it comes to feedback. Has there ever been a time where a dev or a studio hit you up and be like, come on, Jay God? No. Or just they pretty much stay out of it? No. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, like, some of the people might joke. Um, like, w one time they're like, oh, you're not going to play the campaign, huh? <laughs> because I made a joke saying, hey, if it's not early, I ain't playing it. Yeah, if yeah. I have the choice between multiplayer, zombies, and, and campaign, campaign is not getting chosen. I don't care mm -hmm. if it's the greatest campaign of all time. Unless you give me quadruple XP in there, it ain't happening. Like, it's right. just not going to happen. And that's the way it is. And I was honest. But they made a joke, and it was clearly a joke. It wasn't like, <laughs> oh, yeah. screw you, Jay God. No, it wasn't one of those. So I, I think those things happen and where it's just kind of funny, but... You know, it is what it is. You've done some um, desk analysis. I'm trying to remember which land that was. Is that the Baca Bros land where you were actually sitting at the desk? I did Baca Bros on the desk. I also did uh, Warzone. Uh, I did a few different Warzone tournaments, but they were all COVID. So I did them from my house. Mm -hmm. But it was still, yeah. Yeah. Is that enjoyable for you? Do you like being on the desk? I, I do enjoy that. I, I think uh, there's things I like could continue to work on behavior wise like whether it's nodding or or pointing or hand gestures or whatever but those are just things that are practice i'll sure. probably not really get those types of practices because i think that a lot of people they kind of already have the set crew um of who they want and i think part of the problem too was because of the success during warzone one companies paid a lot uh so I think the rate at which I got paid was way overpaid probably. And now there's people that are getting paid less than that. And then for me to get it, I'd have to get paid less than them. Mm -hmm. So I don't think generally those offers will, will just happen organically. And then now that it's been so much time, their resumes are way more stacked. They, they, they cast, they analyze, they do all like a tournament every week. I'm like, I haven't touched nothing in, you know, <laughs> two years on casting or anything like that. So I think uh, those types of variables just make it so those opportunities will be few and far between, especially now that we do the pulse check stuff where when we do a land, like an actual war zone land, like world series of war zone in a week or so uh, I'm going to be on the couch. I can't be on the desk and the couch, you know? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I think those are all variables that tie into it. Is that officially released? You guys are going to be doing a couch at World Series of Warzone this year? I don't know specifically. I've talked to Hector about it and I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. I'm not doing the watch parties normally, but uh, I said, if you want me like there, I'm going to, I'll be there like on, on, on land day. Yeah. And he goes, all right, cool. Yeah. Just so I know, like. I got the heads up, basically that part. But in terms of what what's going to actually happen there, I don't know if it'll be like last year. Yeah, like, that's still up in the air. I don't know. Maybe Hector does know, and we just haven't talked about it yet. But essentially, I'm available if it's available. <laughs> essentially, yeah. It was fun to watch last year. I like that. I think I watched that more than the main cast, probably. Um, yep. Your son's getting older, and if you watch part of your streams, uh, he'll occasionally pop in, which is always funny. Um, he, d What's his feeling on Call of Duty? Does he play Call of Duty, or is he not about Call of Duty? No, he likes COD, but he plays a lot of games. Uh, I started him on COD like when he was like three or something like that. He played like Blackout 4, or yeah, Blackout 4. Blackout as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, Black Ops. Why am I saying Blackout 4? What the hell? <laughs> Black Ops 4. My brain is fried. Black Ops 4, and then he played uh, also uh, Blackout. Um, and then now he, he plays Fortnite, Apex, Roblox, you know, those, but he also plays single games like Spider-Man or whatever. Uh, he primarily watches like Lucky and those types of channels where they're a little bit more high energy mm -hmm. geared towards kids, uh, or young adults, I guess, uh, the, the, the target audience is, uh, and he's into it. He likes it. He, he, even, he, he always says he wants like a YouTube channel. I'm like, ah, you gotta wait till you're like 13. Yeah. Like. 13 you got to be an adult uh, not adult but like uh mature enough to behave and act as if you're mature like an adult where like oh i have responsibilities i have to do these things a 10 year old is like oh i gotta take out the trash ah uh, you know like how are you gonna handle a youtube channel bro no it ain't gonna happen <laughs> and I'm, i mean i'm sure some of his friends play call of duty are you like a celebrity when you uh do drop offs or anything like that or if they come mm, over not really what what tends to happen is he used to do it a lot more but we've had conversations where he's supposed to limit it just because for privacy stuff sure um but what pretty much what ends up happening is he'll tell them and then all of a sudden they look me up and then it's like oh you have a million subscribers like that's like a huge deal you know yeah of course uh and they're like oh oh 
oh, and then, you know, the, the parents will try to find a way to put a conversation together with it, which is kind <laughs> of interesting, but it's cool. I, 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 I think it's interesting just because it's like a weird dynamic, but it, it, it's cool. I get the flexibility to go on field trips. So that's nice too. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, yeah, no, it's, it's just like normal until he's a little bit older. All right, Jay God, we're doing five heads on Mount Rushmore, the five heads of war zone. I know there's four heads, but, uh, it's funny to make the people mad a little bit when they say five. Um, so who are your top five war zone players of all time this is going back to the first war zone it doesn't have to be they're the best players by any means it yep. can be the influence they had on war zone uh it can be their skill in war zone it can literally be any factors you want who are the five mount rushmore heads you're putting up there so i, I did get a chance to think about this one because i did see the bread one which is pretty <laughs> cool uh i will say that uh number one is swag i think that's like the first one uh, and then you have like iron. I think iron's another like just part of the the core part of Warzone. Everyone knew like no new, new iron, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, you probably got uh, Tommy for just the 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 ability that the, they had to dominate for those years. Uh, and then Biffle, I think it's just the ano anomaly. Like he's just so different. Obviously, now we have a little bit more competitive with uh, Hisoka and Shifty, like being the number one person. But Biffle was like the guy and is still basically the guy, which is kind of crazy. Um, what's that for? And yep. then uh, I, I would I would say myself, even though I know that sounds like uh, I just feel like that has to be the case. There's no way I put like, you on there. Yeah. Um, which I know that feels kind of like. Uh, I, I don't know. It's kind of weird to say it, but I feel like it's true. Yeah, I mean, scenario. like I said in the beginning of this, your name is synonymous with Warzone, Call of Duty, so it would be crazy not to put you on there. Um, looking forward, World Series of Warzone is coming up. You mentioned Biffle, Hisoka, and Shifty. Um, I assume they're going to be one of them, but who are your top three teams that you think could win it all? It's kind of weird because the teams have been so inconsistent on that top end. Uh, I feel like... If Deuce Amir's team wants to show up, they could be second or third. If uh, Unrational's team wants to show up, they can be second or third. And I think those are like some random ones. Sage's team with Swag and you know Adrian could be like top three. Adrian uh, Aiden's team, they could show up and just be like, we're just different today. Mm -hmm. and, and it just happened. And I think because of the format, you're going to have general like ways that people play we we're going to get a preview on saturday because they're going to get those six matches and then going into sunday then people are going to have a head start so yep. we're going to have kind of a inkling if people have a bad match it's not as bad on the second day because you already have those bonus points to start off with so i think those are a couple of the teams even though there's probably uh so many that could fit in slot into the second and third i'd like to see some of those Breadman's team i'd like to for him to do well with uh, their team because it's like one of those things that they're not doing scrims. Mm -hmm. So everyone's like, oh, they're, they don't care. They're not trying. But then if they show up on land, it's like, ah, see, doesn't yeah. matter. We don't need to do no scrims, you know? So <laughs> I think that'd be kind of cool. Uh, I mean, individually, I like them as well as players or as people. So I think that's cool. But that's probably around the, that grouping. And then there's a couple other like sneaky people that could just... Psh, <laughs> go yeah. up to the top but I, I feel like if you have common sense and you've been actually paying attention there's no one else winning but but that t the ssd team yeah i was gonna say you slot everyone into second or third but you didn't slot anyone into potential first place <laughs> no. so you got it well, locked in like think about it this way they've had like 30 tournaments and out of the 30 tournaments i believe they've won 27 of them and if they didn't win they were second or third in the other those other three yeah like if we're betting, the odds are in their favor. <laughs> yeah, what's Vegas got the line set at? I don't know. It's probably like <laughs> barely one, you know, almost barely over. You get nothing back. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking forward to the new war zone, um, which is, you know, coming out here soon. Um, you know, what do you think they could do to keep weapon balancing better and keep the, the meta more fresh? So one is like, I've drawn it before, like on a, like a, a graph and paint or whatever but there's like a top line where up if, if the gun kills slower than that is let's say fo focus on particularly close range if the gun kills slower than that it's automatically non-meta mm -hmm. no matter how fast it moves no matter how 
big the ammo mag is, no matter how good Sprint to Fire, if it kills slower than this line, it's not meta. It'll never be meta. And if it kills below another line, then it's like, eh, it's kind of broken. It kills too quick. But it could be fun. And that's fine. I feel like they should be balancing guns to get as close to that bottom line as possible. Um, if they cross it, then those are fun for a week or two. But in general, the gun should be around that specific line. And where we've seen the most like balanced metas in the past is between around 570 to 630. That's kind of where if the gun can sit in there, that 60 millisecond bubble, it's generally going to be the meta. And it feels good as long as you make the gun feel good. It kills in that bubble, you're generally fine. Sometimes there's going to be outliers because the gun fires too slow, or it has a weird headshot multiplier, or the sprint to fire sucks, or it has an open bolt delay, or iron, iron sights suck. There's variables. But I think on some of those instances, having eight attachments could be helpful. I think that's another plus, especially if there's like, oh, this gun's good with six, seven, or eight attachments. And there's been guns like that, even in the current meta, where it's like, oh, I really wish this gun had an extra two attachments. It needs it for velocity. It needs mm -hmm. it for recoil or whatever the case is. The other part is the long range meta. Usually that falls right around 900 to 1,000, depending if it's a low recoil or harder hitting, higher recoil. Uh, and that's usually the same line. And I think there's so many guns outside of that where what ends up happening is when we do have that one good gun that's actually in that Goldilocks zone, then no other guns are in the Goldilocks zone. And it should be where the one gun is there and it's probably slightly better than the Goldilocks zone, but then there's like seven options in the Goldilocks zone where it's like, all right, I'm tired of using the STG. Let me go over to the Holger 556. The, the, and you just go down the, the weapon. Let me use the MCW. It's been buffed six times. Still not meta. What's the problem? Let's just break that thing, you know? But I think uh, there's some autonomy that maybe wasn't present in the past year. Uh, in ability to just tune stuff. Maybe that was on Sledgehammer's end um, and not necessarily Raven. Who knows? Uh, but I feel like this one, uh, the conversation that I had, that Treyarch is interested in having open metas for both small you know their game and big map in combination with raven so that should be a huge w uh which i felt like that was kind of the messaging last year but it just never happened so yeah. i don't know but the feeling definitely this year felt different it's good to hear I and mean, you got a trademark goldilocks zone i think i know the, the meta's not in the goldilocks <laughs> zone i know um what's the biggest pitfalls i need to avoid in the new war zone to make it not Modern Warfare 2, obviously movement, but uh, what are some of the biggest pitfalls you think they could fall into that they should avoid? Uh, I don't think there's really anything. I think as long as the game comes out the way it is, it's going to be fine. Obviously, some people are concerned about movement and stuff like that, and we've already got a patch note for the base beta that mm -hmm. already addresses some of those things, so that could be huge. Uh, the meta is definitely a portion of it, but... I don't really think there's anything. I, I really wish they would have actually committed and just said Warzone 3 this year. Yeah. And so they could actually distance itself from Warzone 2. Even though they went to the Warzone name as a better... They figured out that, hey, you know what? If you <laughs> you put a stinker out there with Warzone 2, it's basically gone for the rest of the life cycle. So I don't really think there's anything they're going to do to mess it up. Obviously, the hacker situation could get worse. The servers could get worse. But people play with those in the current state. We had mm -hmm. all those issues in Warzone 1. We haven't had all these graphical bugs and all these other things that made the game literally unplayable. People could sit inside of a loadout. Like, people act <laughs> like that game was perfect, bro. What yeah, are we yeah, doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can, actually, you can sur survive in the gulag until the end of the game. <laughs> <yep>. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Nostalgia, man. It's a hell of bro, a drug. <laughs> we, we had we had two people gulags in Warzone 2. What are we doing? <laughs> oh, my God, I forgot. You had a duo and your team would leave. And then we had a juggernaut in the gulag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had AI walking the map, bro, and strongholds. <laughs> like, we're good. I, I think yeah. we're fine. If we're not nitpicky, <laughs> like, we're good. You know, we can nitpick and say, hey, you know what? I'd appreciate these things to you know, change, but they're not going to be deal breakers, I don't think. I think most people are just going to enjoy the game. It'll be sweaty, of course, because... It's Warzone where we're at now with SBMM. It just is what it is. Are you one of the people who was for bringing for dance back or were you against that or are you just in the middle? I am for it in the sense that I understand that it might not be my target demo. Like, I don't care. I'm going to play COD. Mm -hmm. But 
what ends up happening is we've seen it with years over years over years. They've had six nuke towns. Yeah. A, a plus, because we had one on Blackout, and then we also had a nuke town in some other game, you know. But we've also had the same thing with shipment. They bring it back every dang year with the MW games, and even in Sledgehammer games now, we get shipments. <laughs> and it's like, well, clearly the, the, the player base doesn't want anything new. That's why Rebirth has been so successful. It's kind of held over the game, to be honest. Yeah. And I think Verdansk, with these quality of life changes and improvements to the game as a whole, it, it on it should play better, even though people won't say it plays better. And it'll give people opportunity because a lot of people that haven't played the game in two years. There was somebody in my comment section, we were spectating randoms, and the guy goes, how'd that guy buy so many UAVs? And I go... <laughs> What do you mean? You could buy as many as you want. He goes, oh, no, I thought there was a limited two. I was like, bro, there hasn't been a limited two since the start of... <laughs> like, dude hasn't played in two years. Yeah. Like, those are the players that they're bringing back. The people that are already playing, lack of a better phrase, and they don't actually care about those players. You're already there. They're trying yeah. to get the players back that left. That mass exodus that happened in MW2, that's who they're trying to get. Mm -hmm. that makes if you're sense. playing the game... Regardless if it's Urzikstan, Almazra, or Verdansk, you didn't leave during the, 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 the bad times. You're <laughs> right. not going to leave during the good times. Mm -hmm. They're going to get those other people back. So I think that's the general idea. And then we can actually feel like we're starting to actually move forward, uh, get the cloud over Warzone off. I think once Verdansk does come back, I think it'll be March 12th. That's like my estimate because that's a Wednesday. The anniversary is on March 10th, which coincidentally is my birthday. So it's easy to remember. Five year anniversary will be then. All right, you heard it here first, March twelfth for dance returns. <laughs> I hope I'm right on that one. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> Jay got promised. It wasn't me. No, I know, right? <laughs> um, all right, we're getting towards the end here. I appreciate all your time. Um, we've got a couple more, and they're easy. So we're gonna do a lightning round. So lightning round is just whatever comes to your head right away. You don't have to. You can't think about it for too long. Okay. So here we go. Favorite movie? Uh, I would say Major Pain. Favorite band? Uh, Linkin Park. Halloween or Christmas? Uh, Christmas. Apple or Android? Android. Favorite Call of Duty? Uh, MW or uh, BO2. Favorite meta? Uh, probably the Growl MP5. Call of Duty or Destiny? Call of Duty, for sure. NA Destiny's teams? pretty fun, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> NA teams or EU teams? Which ones are better? Uh, top five NA, hands down. Most OP gun ever in Warzone? Uh, probably the Underbarrel F... R556, that shotgun. It was like a one shot up to like 30 meters yeah. or something crazy. That was pretty broken. DMR <laughs> was pretty broken too. We've had a few examples, but yeah. SPR hit scan. <laughs> yeah. Like there was a lot. <laughs> uh, not trying to get you in trouble here, but best COD studio. I don't know. I think it's that one's hard. Yeah. I will say that the times I've interacted, I don't know. It's you don't hard. Have to, I, I know no, you no, deal no, with these guys in real hard. life. It's tough, I'll say, yeah. you know what? I, I don't know. It's it, Yeah, I, I, I will say the people that worked at the studios, everyone's awesome. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. <laughs> the last one. The Swag's new Porsche or the J-God minivan? Uh, well, I already got the minivan. The Porsche is like <laughs> seven times the cost of my van. So I think I'll stick with the van for now unless BO6 pops off again. Who knows? There we go. <laughs> All right, you did it, Jay. God, I appreciate you doing the lightning round. Um, just a couple more questions for you. Um, what does the future of Warzone look like over the next three years? Like, does it just keep keep growing, keep the momentum it has, keep the player base it has, or is it eventually going to die down? I think realistically, there's no competition for COD. Um, it's been proven time and time again that COD players are just addicted to COD in a, in a way that is hard to explain or, or even understand for people outside of COD. Uh, they always venture out to other games, but then they find their way back eventually. Um, I think we had a huge influx in Warzone 1, uh, free-to-play game. First time COD was free-to-play. Hopefully at some point multiplayer will go free-to-play. I think that would be awesome for just the franchise as a whole. Obviously, they still got to make money off of microtransactions, which they definitely do. But I think a free-to-play model would just be great. More players is always better, I think, in the case, as long as they can run the game. Uh, on top of that, I think... Based off the rumors, this year we're supposed to get another Treyarch COD. So it's supposed to be like a year two, essentially a DLC for this version. Uh, so they get two years to essentially continue to build and adapt. So not much course correction there. If like it's, it's running smooth, it's going to keep running smooth. The interesting part will be, will they drop MW2 weapons in Warzone? Or will mm. we actually go to four games in, in Warzone, which would be new? I think this could be an interesting thing instead of resetting Warzone. 
they could just drop off the 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 third year ago game or whatever, yeah. and and we just continue to move forward on the base game. I think uh, that direct shift that we had in Warzone Two was too volatile. You don't really want to change the whole game. Just you waste all progress when you do that because you have to develop it from scratch essentially. Yeah. Uh, and then the following year will be the interesting year. What will IW do? Because M MW2 caused like irreparable damage to the franchise, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll have to do something good to really like change that stance on people of how bad decisions they made. Because there were clearly core decisions to the fundamental gameplay that were just awful. And then we get Sledgehammer again, and then that should be good based off this past year. I got a lot of confidence in Sledgehammer. So I think it can just continue to float. Uh, there's really no competitor in the BR space. Everything that comes out, it has to directly try and take players away from Fortnite, Apex, and Call of Duty. Those are like the three biggest battle royales. Extraction shooters are kind of on the rise. DMZ, I don't see happening again, mm -hmm. especially with like some of the games that are coming out are actually pretty good. Extraction shooters... Uh, and everyone's still got to try and get Tarkov players off their game. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's in a good spot. And it's just going to continue to grow. Uh, and I don't see, at least for the next year or two, I don't see anyone deciding to take a nosedive on Call of Duty. Maybe IW. We'll see. But <laughs> um, This question is mostly for myself. I was pumped to find out you were a Packer fan. How did that happen? So, actually, when I was in um, young, probably like, I don't know, six um, my dad watched football all the time and he, he was a 49ers fan and I had other family members since we're from LA, they were Rams fans and I had other families. They were Raiders fans. Well, I just happened to be young watching football and the game that just happened to be on was the Packers. I think it was, uh, the Packers, I think it had to have been a regular season game or something. And I was like, oh, cool. I want the Packers to win. They won. And that was kind of it. And then fortunately, the following year, they ended up winning like the Super Bowl. Nice. <laughs> so so I was like, oh, cool. I got a good team now. And then the next year they lost to the Broncos or whatever. So yeah, that kind of sucked. That. Yeah. And then we had a long stretch of nothing. Then we finally got a good defense. We had a Aaron Rodgers. We got another Super Bowl. And then we didn't get another good defense. And mm -hmm. it's just been like, eh. And then, but then we get, you know, maybe three back-to-back -back Hall of Fame quarterbacks isn't bad. It's not you bad. know, winning a lot of it's games is cool. Super Bowls would be better, but you know it is what it is. We can't all be the the Patriots with the top five defense and number one <laughs> Hall of Fame quarterback all time, or, or and you know coach all time. So. Yeah, <laughs> we play in Brazil tonight. What do you think? We got this game tonight? I don't know. It's against the Raiders or something, right? Eagles, or, Eagles, Eagles, yeah. Eagles. I don't know. They're pretty good. They paid the other dude a lot of money. Hurts. <laughs> yeah. He better mm -hmm. he better show up or else. But so did so did Love. Love got paid a lot of money yeah, too. Yeah, he got paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's weird. On huh? the game on a Friday, it's just because it's in Brazil. Huh? I think it's because it's in Brazil. Yeah. And then we get a double Monday night probably. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I hope they come out good. I mean, because I you know what's kind of funny with sports, just as an aside, is I'm a Packers fan like like yourself, right? So we watch the games when they actually come on. And it's funny because outside, it's all narrative based off win-loss, right? Mm -hmm. When when Aaron Rodgers uh, was having a great year, they were losing games and because they were getting like 30 points allowed every game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they were like, oh, yeah, has he fallen off? I was like, bro, are you watching the games? <laughs> Bro's good. Like, what are we mm -hmm. doing? We just need a better team. And I think, like, it's nice when you get the wins if it aligns with the actual skill of the team. Because there's somewhere he's like, ah, this team should just naturally win. Yeah. You know what I mean? But... Sometimes you get these stupid losses and it's like, bro, why yeah. are they dropping passes? What's going <laughs> on? But yeah, sports is sports is interesting, I think. Uh especially as you get down the road with more games, playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been to Lambo? I haven't. I wanna go. I Have wish I would have gone before. Yeah. But. Well, if you ever want to go, hit me up. I can get us tickets and get us in there. So that's what's up. Be good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jay God. That's it. I appreciate all your time today. Before you leave, though, you got to hit me with your best YouTube thumbnail pose. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That Perfect. part actually sucks at YouTube. I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, bro, it's cringe. Everyone you knows it's cringe, game, but though, it works. Right? It works. You got to play the yeah. game to win. <laughs> all right, man. Hey, I really appreciate your time, dude. This was awesome. Thank hey, you. I forgot. I got the, the J God sweatshirt That's on. Up. We're matching the best the one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, man. Take it easy. Have a good day. Nice. Peace out.